uh, well, we met Max, uh, something like, I think, three years ago. And uh, Max was uh, a person responsible for, uh, for technical uh, uh, management of a project uh, which uh, is called uh, Process about, uh, and this project uh, puts together uh, uh, investigations, uh, research on uh, solutions for exascale challenges. So I hope that uh, you, you will be delighted with this uh, seminar. Max, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marian. And indeed, um, we know us in the project since three years, but honestly, I joined a lecture of you five years ago, Introduction to Quantum Computing, and that's the first time we met. So yes. we are going back almost five, five years. That's quite impressive. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present our project here uh, to, to this audience of, the, of SANO. And it's quite true what you said. It's it's uh, it's gone very very good and very com very challenging the last few years because process. Um, that's what I want to present here. Uh, enables people like Mara who presented a few weeks ago to do their research, um, and that's our main aim. We want to enable how we do that, what we enable in detail. That's uh, something I want to show you. Um, in this presentation. Um, I called the talk towards exascale ready ecosystems. I think we need to talk a bit about what is exascale, um, what are ecosystems, and of course, process. Process stands for providing computing solutions for exascale challenging. Hell, that sounds very challenging. And that sounds also like we want to solve every challenge that's around exascale. Um, let's see how we do. Let's see how, how uh, effective and uh, efficient and uh, successful our approach is. Um, process is part of a Horizon 2020 framework um, focused on data intensive um, ecosystems. And we are part, we are part of that call. Um, so we started three years ago, as we pointed already out, and we ended two weeks ago. So that's quite uh, almost a finished a project for the lifetime of the production uh, development. Um, but we are preparing some, some final things, preparing the, the, the final review in a few weeks. And that gives me also the opportunity not only to, to tell you what we plan to, what we are working on, but also what we achieved. Uh, and that's quite um, interesting. And I hope you, you enjoy it. Um, as Marian pointed out, you can always ask some questions if that is possible, if you need to. Uh, if not, we have the questions at the end. Um, process, I told you before, um, what do we want to do? We want to help the key players um, around Europe. It's of course focused on, on the Europe research and industry. Um, we want to enable scientific communities and companies to, to yeah, take their applications, take their research um, on a new level by entering new areas they didn't enter before, because we will talk about it. Exascale, but also petascale computing, what's, what, what we have today is quite challenging for everybody who is not an HPC expert. And um, I know also when we started with the project with all the use cases, you will see all the five of them in this presentation. Um, some started from scratch, but some had quite old code and applications. And, that has to that was to be uh, portable uh, or be, uh, uh, changed and adapted to all the new architectures, the new uh, processors, and all the things that change. Um, why we think we have now a good approach, they do not need to do that anymore. We will talk about that. And of course, at the end, what do we what do we want to have? Uh, we want to show our approach. We want to have service prototypes and tools that can scale up to exascale. Um, that's quite challenging. You will also see because we don't have an exascale system right now, but what we do is simply show that you can make use of a petascale system. And if that's valid for a petascale system, we assume and we predict it will also be um, valid for an exascale system. And exactly, um, not only to, to enhance already uh, users on those petascale system, systems, but also open those computing capabilities to new uh, communities, which really have no idea 
how many uh, possibilities are out there, how to use a computing system, and that's what we are. Uh, you already um, exascale. Uh, I think that's that's uh, you see here the, the the peak performance about the, the 2020 tune list of the top 500. I think today the new top 500 list will come come out because in parallel there is this week starting with the keynote. I think in two hours, uh, the supercomputing conference, and that's quite interesting. Um, what will be the new approaches? We will call, call uh, talk about the uh, supercomputing also later. Um, but the, the question might be who in fact needs exascale? Exascale, that's quite challenging. Um, who, which application needs at once over 1 million cores? Which uh, application needs 1 million terabytes of data at once? And the simple answer is regarding our project and our experience, none of our use cases, but um, they need parts of it. They need the approaches. They need the, 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 the middleware we are providing to access terascale, petascale systems, to, to, to enlarge their, their computing capabilities, to enhance their, their development, to enhance their, also the ideas of their scientific communities in the background. And that's also what we want to do. We are not aiming at this moment to have an ecosystem and a framework that makes automatically use of a complete whole exascale computer as soon as it is possible and available. We aim to, to move current applications, current technologies one step further that there is the potential in the future to scale up to exascale. But we do not aim all our five use cases um, to make use of one of the largest supercomputers in the world at once today. But in small steps, we are try to enable those to go there to enable that. Marian already pointed out uh, where do we come from, and he said already that there is network management in our name. That's the Munich Network Management Team. Um, I'm in the. We are in the middle. That's the University of Munich. Um, in Munich, there are two different um, uh, universities, um, the Technical University of Munich and, of course, the University of the Federal Arms. And we have um, one computing center. Um, and I don't want to talk about much about our computing center um, since there will be a talk about the director of the computing center on Monday, 7th December. So if you're interested, I think in three weeks, um, you can have a look at the insights of maybe the computing center, what they are doing, what, how it's funded, maybe, I'm not sure what's the focus, um, uh, but I think since the top 500 comes out, it might also deal with how to enable exascale in the future. Let's see, um, coming back to process, that was a bit of motivation. Um, process is led by LMU, so we are coordinating the project, but we have seven others very good very uh, productive partners inside the, the, the project. Um, parts of them use cases, parts of them development, and parts of them dissemination and exploitation. Uh, we have the University of Amsterdam. Um, we have the Netherlands eScience Center, both from the Netherlands, of course. Um, we have the special university in Switzerland, the HESO, with the use case, the medical use case from Mara Graziani you saw a few weeks ago. We have a business use case from Lufthansa Systems in Germany. Uh, we have Inmark Europe, our dissemination and exploitation partner in Spain. We have the university in Slovakia, the computing science department. Um, and we have, of course, Marian's team from the ATH University and CypherNet. And before we go in Medias Res, maybe we can also have a look what were the, the uh, starting um, uh, what we are, what was our test bed, so to say, what we, we want to develop data service oriented exascale solutions, but we had to, of course, test it. So we need to include in our test bed, in our production system, in our test system, quite challenging um, resources. And we did that in Munich uh, with the LSAT, that's also hosting the, still, I think, the fastest supercomputer in the European Union, since Switzerland is not part of the European Union, um, the SuperMOOC NG. We have uh, mostly cloud resources in Bratislava. We had the Prometheus cluster in Krakow um, integrated, also their cloud resources. And we have the SurfSara um, clusters from uh, Amsterdam also 
included. And what you see here, the approach is quite distributed. And since we use this test bed, not only for testing and development, uh, but we also try to use it in production, you will see later, um, we found out that there are limitations, that there are challenges we as a kind of uh, ecosystem or framework provider, we cannot overcome because there are connections. They are not getting faster because we need to transfer a few terabytes of data somewhere. Um, there are connections, they are not direct. You need to go some, some ways around and that's all challenging uh, for the future, but I will report on that later. The vision of process, and that's our main idea. Um, we wanted to uh, develop and deliver major services and tools. And how should they be built? They should be built like building bricks. You know, the, these small um, Lego uh, bricks uh, you can um, put together as you need. And that's the idea. Everybody, every use case had to could collect or sort um, or joy and made a choice of the services and modules um, process offers and make the most important, most efficient um, ecosystem for themselves. So what you see here, and we, we go into detail here, um, we have the, the green one is the data service and the yellow one is the IEE. I think two weeks ago, it was also presented here at Zano. Um, what's the um, execution? But that was, I think, the MEE, uh, but that's a kind of um, uh, enhancement for a process. Um, we have the compute service, the Wimwork, and we have that in purple here, our five use cases. Um, I will tell you what's behind those building bricks later. And we have, and that's quite new, uh, the mini process. And that's something since we released all software two weeks ago, we also released a complete virtual machine, including the most important services simply for your home as a virtual machine. You can spin it up, you can test what we did. And of course, it's not that tremendous if you do it on a local uh, laptop, but it, in potential, since that are all modules, uh, they come in containers. Um, they don't need any uh, existing ecosystem, they have no dependencies. They just need to be deployed on your machine and they work. And that's quite uh, impressive. And not directly included into the ecosystem, we have also some more uh, software released um, and developed within process that is very, very good um, and is quite, will quite do an impact, I think, in future. In the future. Um, projects uh, focusing on other things, but I will talk about that also later. So what do we want to do at the end? We want to have modularity. We want to have uh, the dependency less um, containers and we want to deploy that. We want to deploy it on the most challenging computing systems on the European research infrastructures, on the most uh, scalable, on the most performant systems in Europe. And that's quite easy because it is, uh, it's uh, the, that, so that the, the goal is quite easy, um, but that's quite challenging to do it uh, that way um, because we will see um, all these things in theory, they work very well. If we come to production, what I said, they, that is still challenging, but we did a good job. We will see that we proved that we can deploy our services on different clusters on different environments on different machines and we can also compute diff completely different things and enable completely different user communities with the same set of services. And that's our message. Um, I think that the most important message of the project, we, what we did. And going a bit back, um, how did we develop all these services? How did we achieve um, the, the software solutions? We were driven by five use cases. Use case one, that's exascale learning on medical image data. That's quite, that's what Mara Gaziani presented a few weeks ago. Um, I will talk a bit of that, but most of you might have heard that uh, her talk. So I don't go into detail here. Uh, a quite challenging and quite interesting also regarding the solutions use case two analysis of uh, radio astronomy observations. Um, that will deal with petabytes of data uh, that which needs to be processed somewhere and how they did it before, how they do it now, and what we expect later, I will show you. 
Then we have a use case on supporting innovation based of open data that deals mainly with helping communities to uh, publicate and make available their data sets. And then we have a business use case in salary pricing and airline revenue management uh, from Lufthansa Systems. Um, and we have an agricultural based use case uh, which, which correlates simulation and observation based on Copernicus, meaning satellite data images um, to help farmers in the European Union uh, to make the best use of um, their fields of the water, fertilizer, and so on. So I know that you are all in principle medical oriented uh, and have a medical background, but I need you and I want to present also the other use cases because that's one of the very nice things of process. We don't have only focused on one community. We didn't focus on machine learning. We didn't focus on cloud. We didn't focus on HPC. We did bring everything together and we developed resource, uh, modules, services, and many other things to, to deal with all these things at once. So I, very good. So, and talking about containerization and modularity, um, these use cases make use of containers and modules developed as services for process. The use cases themselves are also developed in modules and containers. And also, if you look at the variety of the different modules for, let's see, the, the use case one, you might, might know it, there are the cabinet layers one, two, three, all deployed as for, so to say, standalone containers. You can use them directly. You can download them from GitHub and make use of them. Going to the LOFA, the, the radio astronomy use case, there are different things like a web portal, like a pipeline backend, like uh, also the IEE configuration um, tool for the integration into the IEE. Um, that's also standalone released and you in principle can use it. Of course, that's part of the truth. If you want to make use of everything, um, you need for the use cases, especially um, maybe not only a pre-processing. Of, of course, you can do pre-processing without processing and on visualization. But at the end, you want to see something. Um, that's of course, that's why you need maybe a complete pipeline. Um, but in principle, all these steps are uh, released separately as modules and containers. And I did <laughs> that graphic. Uh, I did it this morning. Um, because that's everything we did. Um, that's any module, any repository, um, any, any uh, service, any tool, any pipeline, anything from the use cases and the services. Um, that's everything we developed so far um, in the project and released especially. And each of these containers uh, you can use standalone. Each of these containers have a public uh, repository with a permissive open source license. Um, and that's really, really, I think a good thing that uh, of course it was uh, given since it's a Horizon 2020 project, but we followed from the first time an open source approach. We wanted to um, make public what we developed. We wanted to uh, guarantee sustainability. We wanted to guarantee other things um, that people can reuse the things we did. And that's what, what uh, our approach has, uh, was mainly driven by. And going uh, maybe to the to the services and um, in in a bit detail, I, I that's if I go back, um, you see how much we did in the last three years. I cannot go and I will not go because that might also be quite boring um, into too much technical details. Uh, meaning I don't we don't look at each service, um, each, each um, use case in detail what they did on a technical level. If you're interested in that, at the end, we have a software repository. You can access anything directly online. We have all the deliverables publicated somewhere. Uh, you can have more information if you want to. Uh, it's all there, uh, and I will show you uh, where you find it. Um, but having... A look, I may, maybe I open all the things at once. 
Um, what's here interesting is also we, we focus on a starting point for the end user. That's the IAE. The IAE, again, has connections to the orchestration service, the compute service, and the data service. But also more than that, there is also an adapter to a, a, a community origin um, portal. There is a Jupyter plugin where you can just, you know, maybe the, the Jupyter notebooks. In the IEE, you can open a Jupyter notebook and deploy your, your workflow on the HPC resource in principle. Um, we have Cloudify as an orchestrator and access to cloud resources. We have Rim, Rim, Rimrock um, developed by Marian's team at Cyphernet uh, for accessing and de deploying and scheduling uh, jobs on HPC resources. And that's the uh, the biggest part, uh, we have the data service um, developed by our colleagues in the University of Amsterdam um, with quite, and that's what we will, I will show you a bit in detail, but I'm, I must say I'm not a data service expert. I'm not, I did not develop those things. I, I just know what they are doing in principle, and that's what I show you. But what you see here, there are a lot of single services, and there are a lot of adapters. We speak not only grid FTP, we also speak SSHFS, we also speak uh, FTD. So we can connect really in this heterogeneous infrastructure, a lot of resources together to really enable data transfers, to enable distributed computing, what Marian said, that's one of our main keys at, in Unix also, distributed computing, virtualization, um, that's all coming more and more. Um, we're doing that a, a lot of years ago, um, and since, a lot of, since many years. And that's also um, not only done by us, but also by the, the colleagues in Amsterdam. And they enhance their services, their developments the last three years very much. And we are really happy, we as a coordinator, with all the, uh, the work done in the project. And that's quite um, why I'm really happy to you uh, to present also the project to you. Um, I said I don't want to go too detail, and now you have a quite technical um, uh, architecture. But what's important here? Um, this here is the end user that might be you in in, in some month um, you have an application and what you want to do is you go want to go here um, and you want to have on the resource layer your application on an hpc resource executed working on terabytes of data today you have no idea how you do that and there there comes process in play that's why we have developed this middleware. This middleware is capable of making your life easier, so to say, because we are caring about the orchestration, the configuration, the deployment, the submission, um, the management of your job, and also that's quite also challenging the output collection. At some point, you not only need to um, have a resource allocation, but at some point you also need to move your data to some storage. You can download your data. If you have a visualization post-processing and you're producing images, you want to see these images. It, it makes no sense if they are on a very secure um, storage inf infrastructure somewhere in Europe, you simply want to click somewhere and want to download them. And that's also one possibility we are doing here. Um, I also want to mention uh, regarding cloud resources um, in the second phase of our project, we also integrated the European Open Science Cloud so we could also deploy workflows on EOSC. Um, that's quite, um, that was a quite good news um, because EOSC is, is, uh, will be one of the main yeah, key players in the next years regarding all those kinds of services and we are already integrated it. So um, we have, as I said, Munich, Amsterdam, Krakow, Bratislava integrated, but in principle, in principle, you can deploy your application, your code anywhere um, on any connected resource and through EOSC, a lot of resources are connected. Um, that's what I already showed you. Um, and I want to talk a bit about the main part of the, um, of the data service. That's the micro infrastructure um, containers. And I also saw in the, in the audience that there is one of the developers, and I'm sorry if I'm maybe not so detailed as he could be, um, but that's the, the most um, enabling thing we did in the project. 
um, we managed to deploy a data service that proves to have almost no overhead, but enables uh, data transfers. I can open that um, data transfers and distributed management, scheduling of data transfers, stage in, stage out across European top supercomputing centers. And why? Because they decided to go for a programmable microinfrastructure. What it is, you will see in a few minutes. Um, what's the, the benefit of that? I can say, say you that now it's independent, scalable, and it's distributed. And that's the fun fact. If you have an infrastructure, a software infrastructure distributed among the uh, local um, or geographically distributed places, you can try to play as an abstract that to that they would be one data layer, for example. So what we did here is we enabled really distributed data computing. And that's quite one of the most challenges people have today, um, how to access data, how to process data, how to um, really do the computation on the data somewhere. Data lies around Europe everywhere. There are so many data storages. We will see a few, if you're talking about low fault, there are petabytes of data. But where they, those petabytes are, there are no computing facilities you can you can um, usually um, do your computation on. That means you need to download terabytes of data in, in former days, maybe to to a intermediate storage. Then you need to uh, upload it again to your production system. Then you can do the computation and so on. We are doing that. We can have a, a, a management tool that allows you to concentrate on your work and we are doing the rest. How that works in detail, I'm not going too detailed here, um, but for each application, for each workflow, we define each container, each service we are needing. Um, we, we, it's really necessary. So we need the adapters we need, we need to uh, integrate the, the, the apps um, and of course um, describe you know, the, the description and then comes uh, our uh, data service what's called Lopsidir and Lopsidir takes all these um, deploy application descriptions has a deployment service and it's a Kubernetes based um, um, yeah micro infrastructure of containers adapted to your needs of or the, to the needs of any application you want to run also on the data transfer you want to execute and that's why and maybe i can yeah, first that slide um th th that's where this data service plays the most important role while when talking about the middleware you you have as i said the workflows you want to execute and you have the resources and all the data management Will it be controlled by process by the data service? We are, um, we are, we are. What do we do? We 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 have there um, exactly. And does applications define their micro infrastructure? Um, since these are again containers, um, of course the, the the resource needs to support the container technology in principle. But if it does, those containers are portable and scalable and can also not you you don't only have to um you can also maximize uh, your throughput because connections are limited also um i know in the supercomputing centers um the, the entry bandwidth is limited but of course you can for your purpose make more use of that if you're doing uh, data transfers in parallel so if you want to really transfer um, terabytes of data, you can do it, of course, on one line. But if you can use 10 lines, so to say, um, it's much faster. Maybe the resource owner and the network owner might not be happy about that, but we, as a middleware uh, framework, we can support with your decision. And of course, um, that, that's some of the conclusion at the end. Um, there will be a new generation uh, somewhere, and it will be based kind of um, containers, scalable, portable, all these passwords uh, hopping around. And today we are already doing that. Three years ago, we, 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 oh, you're doing containerization. Okay, that's nice. If you have a look at the agenda and the talks at the supercomputing, there are a lot of things based on containerization and exactly this approach, um, low overhead, efficiency driven. Uh, and we did it already three years ago. That's why we have some lessons learned. 
I will talk about later. Um, I think that goes a bit too much into detail because, because you have on the left side the medic uh, on on the right side the medical use case and on the left side the physical use the physics use case, and they share the same containers. Of course, we re we reuse all the containers we did. Uh, we have specific containers for the use cases we can also include in the framework, but in principle, most things we make we reuse. So if we invent one thing for one use case, the other use case can uh, adapt it, of course, and can make use of it directly. And now we are limited to five use cases in future. Since it's released in open source, there is no limitation in use cases. And that's a quite challenging. And I please do not read what's, what's written here. But what I want to point out, that's an example of a deployment of the data service. And if we count, we have the user. Then we have one, two, three services uh, kind of connected with the IEE. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight small containers and small steps working on your purpose, uh, preparing the data, uh, mounting the data, um, preparing your uh, environment for the execution. And then, of course, at the other, uh, at the other end, at the other end, you have the resources, data stores, um, you have the execution environment, you have your RIM work, and you can actually run your application. But the process here, what you need to do, th th that's something you need to do, that you need to do manually. You need to deploy your container, you need to mount your, your, your data somewhere, you, you need to make available all these things you need. Now, what's the aim here? We are doing that. We have automated that. If you configure once your workflow, if you configure once your micro infrastructure, that's all done automatically. Of course, that's an approach driven by five use cases. There are use cases, they have other requirements, but we have such a good team and such a good effort, they pursue the development of their services. So of course, if there is, some major things, it will be integrated in the service. If, for example, you have some needs, our partners will to try to satisfy that. And that's all, um, that's what I said. Here, that's um, uh, overhead measurement from the low file container deployment. And that, sound, that looks quite bad, a catastrophe here. But if you have a look at the number of containers, we are deploying 10, um, uh, X5. So that means um, 100,000 containers at once. And the overhead for deploying 100,000 containers on a large computing facility is expected to last 20 minutes. What you don't know today, these containers might compute for days. So uh, overhead introduced by the, by the platform that might take 20 minutes, while most of the containers work for days or even weeks, if, if uh, possible. Um, that's not much. Of course, and that you see that if you deploy only um, 100 con uh, or 10 or 100 containers, it's really no overhead. And that's, you find more numbers on that and all the deliverables we reported on the website. Um, you can uh, walk through it if you're interested. Um, but we did also good evaluation and validation of our services so that we are quite sure that what we did will has the potential to scale up, not only to petascale, but also probably to, to exascale at some point. Um, so far, um, that was a kind of overview of the architecture and services. Um, what I would do next is present the use cases and how they especially made use <clears throat> about the, the, the ecosystem. Maybe if you have some questions, we also can have that now, but if I see no nothing in the chat, um, we can also continue directly to the use cases. <clears throat> I just have to take a sip of water. And that's, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. Um, that's the first use case you heard about, I said it I think three times, uh, the machine learning and medical imaging. Um, that was quite explained uh, well, well from Mara Gaziani, so I don't want to talk much about it. Um, but medical imaging diagnosis um, is big data and it's really 
getting, yeah, I don't know want to say it's getting worse, but from a computer scientist view, it's getting worse because more pictures are produced, more pictures need to be evaluated and more pictures need to be also analyzed, um, not quite live, but as soon as possible because um, that's medical imaging. That, that's, that's not only some uh, simulation of something, that's real patients and that you know best. And we know that we, as a computer scientist, we need to deliver. We need to deliver solutions that make your life easier, that makes the life easier of a doctor. And I think if we can process what we processed here, um, also some gigabytes per slide in, in with um, 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 uh, machine learning models analyzed in almost um, no time at the end, that's, then we did a good job. But of course, um, we are not here uh, at the end and we don't have a solution for any medical use case. We have one specific. That specific use case has several containers. We put it together in a pipeline. We can deploy it. We can uh, stage in the data. We can stage out the output. Uh, we can, uh, the output is the model. We can deploy the model. Uh, we can um, do the model interference um, and we can analyze the images. And that's what we do from a computer scientist's point of view. We enable the medical scientists to do their actual work. And that's a very good example why we did do that. And yeah, I have two less ideas what this is directly saying. So that's why I just want to show, and you heard it a few weeks ago, what these uh, images mean and what's the scenario directly. I, that's why I, I don't want to say much more about the use case and I would like to proceed to the next use case too. Um, use case two from the Netherlands eScience Center is uh, regarding data the most challenging, let's, uh, I would like to say, because it's the analysis of radio astronomy observations from the low far long-term uh, archive. This archive has data over 50 petabytes. And what they simply want to do is um, do a simple calibration on the data that the physicists and astronomers can use it for their science and calculations. Um, th th that uh, sounds very easy, but in practical, it's, it's terrible. And I'll show you why. Um, what you can do with these things, you can do um, uh, uh, analysis of the cosmic. You can do analysis of solar systems, cosmic rays, uh, pulsars, and all the other things uh, you can do in the astro astronomy. Um, these are all based on simple, yeah, kind of simple, um, on simple observations and measurements um, done somewhere on the world. From that place somewhere on the world, those measurements from antennas, from what, what else need to be collected somewhere, need to be made available, um, and you need to download it at, at some point and make use of it. What that means in principle, you see here. Um, on the left side, you have the LOFA. That's the actual running and up radio telescope system across Europe. Um, it's a distributed software telescope. You have uh, 80, uh, almost 90,000 antennas. Uh, and this produces, and that's already challenging, 35 terabytes of data per hour. It's raw data. Of course, there is the, the bit of pre-processing and the processing, and but there is coming in every second new data. And these 50 over 50 petabytes in the archive, they 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 increase constantly. And at some point. You also want to have some uh, science and calculations done on the data, and that data needs to be accessible, and that's quite challenging. The complete situation gets more challenging when maybe in yeah five, six years, the SKA, the square kilometer away, um, gets in production. I think in South Africa, uh, no, in Africa and in Australia, uh, exactly there it is written also, and this will produce 300 petabyte per year of already processed calibrated data. So that means it's six times the actual data science of the LOFA archive today per year. And that archive goes a lot of years back today, the LOFA archive. So that will be a huge data and processing problem. And those amounts of data, you cannot, this, uh, you cannot, um, um, 
transfer raw to any place on the earth, you need to uh, decide very well how to transfer which data from which point at which time to which storage facility. From there, you might have again a pre processing of the raw data. Um, to make it available worldwide, because what's the aim of all these uh, instruments and telescopes? Yeah, that the scientists around the world can do their science. And that's what they want to do, but they rely again, because that's mostly um, electrical engineering kind of, um, but they rely again on computer science scientists as us, that we find a solution. How do we transfer that data? How do we process? How can they download their data somewhere on the earth? How do they download a few hundred petabytes to make their um, computations? And just to uh, show you what they are really doing, um, that's from a latest uh, publication from our use case. Uh, you have on the left side uh, the, the roughly calibrated data that's a lot of noise inside there. In the middle, you see initially processing uh, and the direction independent calibration. So that means you can uh, realize more things. And on the right side, it comes clear what it might be. It's a star map. Uh, and before you see the star map um, reproduced on based on the observations from those antennas, there's a lot of noise. Of course, there's a lot of noise. Then if, if you remember where they are, they are, those stations are across Europe. In Europe, there is, it's not quite in Europe. There's a lot of electromagnetic fields. There's a lot of noise. You really get you rid of all these things before, and that's really pre-processing before the astronomers can do their science. So that's quite important to do um, before anything regarding astrophysical research can be done. And with each observation in this archive that has 50 uh, petabytes, and each observation is up to uh, several tens of terabytes, um, you need to do this calibration before you can process it uh, at the first time. Uh, here we have also the, um, the LTA usage. Um, it's an old graphics, it's only going to 2017. Today, we gained um, uh, more than 30 petabytes additionally in the last two years. So it's over 50 petabytes long and it's also a distributed service. It's a distributed service uh, about in Amsterdam, Jülich and Poznan. And of course that's again challenging. If you want to join um, observations uh, or uh, yeah, do computation of different observations which are not located in the same uh, storage facility, you need to transfer from Amsterdam, from Jülich and from Poznan data maybe to Munich before you can even start your computation. And you cannot do that manually. That's, of course, you can, and people are doing that, but it's annoying, it's time wasting. And we want to help those scientists to focus on their code and not to focus on anything else. But that data challenge is not solvable by a single scientist. It's only solvable to the, also to that framework program, the European Commission spin off, where we are part of. We are part of, of um, almost more than 70 projects. Um, trying to find solutions for those challenges. We have our approach, we think it's good, um, but others have other approaches. But um, um, I think ours is, is it's very good. Ah, here you have, I should know my slides at some point, but that's quite challenging. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, the distribution, um, but th th that's what I mean. If, if your observation is here, here, and here, and you want to transfer it to here because you want to do here your your uh, computation, um, you need to use the Xi'an network or whatever network, you have to transfer it and you have to wait days until your first, uh, I didn't mention that because all the observations are on tape archive, having it from tape archive to intermediate a storage where you really can access it takes also days. So that's really frustrating for any um, astronomers and I know a few, um, if you want to do, you can do nothing fast. And we want to help. We want to, uh, that they can use our, um, our ecosystem to, to concentrate on their use. And that's something we discovered in the project. Um, we have problems 
today in Europe, transporting data. Um, if it comes to, to really petabytes of data, it's almost not possible to transfer petabytes of data via wire. I think uh, having a hard disk transported by any company is more efficient, but that's not a thing we could solve. We only could solve software. We also could provide um, a middleware that deals with the infrastructure that is available. And the, the things that are available um, don't satisfy our needs. If we are talking about, we wanna, this, we wanna compute on petabytes of data, we wanna compute distributed, we wanna compute in parallel on distributed data. That's still challenging and I'm pretty sure, and you might hear, hear something um, by Dieter Kranzenmüller in three weeks that stays challenging the next years. Um, what they did uh, in the use case, um, there was already a lot of software available to process the low observations, um, but they had dependencies and you need quite, you have, let's say 17 different packages in very specific versions. And if one version number does not match, uh, you complete pipeline crashes. Um, to overcome this situation, uh, they, um, did the computations inside containers because in a container you can bring your complete environment. It is portable and you can uh, execute it everywhere you want to. So if it's Docker, Singularity, Portman, Charlie Cloud, we don't care. We can support in principle everything that can be really on that kind of ship we have down here. Um, be transported somewhere, um, we can execute, deploy it, and we can manage the workflow that's inside the container because we only care about the container, what's inside, that's up to the scientists. Um, but before they use containers and before they could deploy the containers with our framework, it really required expert knowledge to install and operate it. And I, I did it myself, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. and. Together with the data challenge to process, um, having having uh, dependencies on software, having not the data there, that's, I, I know it quite frustrating. And that's really a level you, you need to reach before you can use a, a today's petascale system. Because if you want to have, for example, your, your application run on a super MOOC you need to do everything yourself. You need to move the data there. You need to have the dependencies uh, because the computing facilities, they don't provide any, not every package you might need. So maybe you need to compile yourself, um, you think yourself, and that's quite, before you even can start your real computation. Uh, I know I've, I said that before, um, but it's, it stays true, it is complicated. And that's where we want to help. Okay, two uh, use cases left I want to present. It's use case 40 in salary pricing and airline revenue management for Lufthansa system. What is ancillary, ancillary pricing? That's quite simple. If you book a flight from A to B and you want to have any extra, that's an ancillary. What we focused here in the use case, it's the first pack. Means if you have, and I prepared something here, uh, for example, I go back to the slide. Uh, if you have, that's from yesterday. If, if I would have been flown to Krakow from Munich uh, today, um, and I would have chosen economy light um, version, there would not, not be any carry on baggage. So, and if you want to have one, it's always the same price. And the industry came up with the idea that it might be reasonable to change the price according to the requests. And that's honestly, uh, let's say, okay, um, uh, a machine learning approach, uh, because there's a huge amount of data that needs to process. Um, you need to train your pricing model. Um, based on an airline's data warehouse that is before Corona, there have been millions of bookings, millions of passengers, of course, uh, and you could analyze that. Of course, um, maybe it's quite uh, optimistic, um, but you could produce a trained model and an optimization algorithm based on that. And the pricing service uh, will be deployed somehow and will uh, offer real-time pricing requests. And this, what we uh, developed here is scalable to some hundreds of millions of requests per day. 
Exactly, and that's uh, how this use case is uh, integrated into the ecosystem. Again, too much detail. Uh, I don't want to go into detail here. Um, important here is that that's, and that's also important for the next use case. Um, industry also always have their assets and industry is not always open science and open source. So here are most of the things are closed source because of course they want to have more money. So they want to make it public. Um, that's the same with use case five. Um, that's uh, agriculture analysis on um, Copernicus data in favor of um, how to use most efficiently what we have on our planet. I, I, that sounds very drastically, but it is, it is. And um, since in a matter of time, I don't, don't go too into detail, but there are a lot of challenges with our environment. Global farming has really become one of the most challenging topics regarding um, climate change, um, usage of resources, uh, sustainability regarding border, regarding um, how can we feed all the people. And here, this SME we are supporting um, can do simulations on, on different crops, how they could evolve, how they are evolving. Um, let's, uh, I come to that later, um, exactly based on images they are using from Copernicus. Um, the Central 1 and Central 2, you might have heard of that. Um, that's a lot um, uh, satellite data, data coming uh, constantly also from space. There's a new uh, storage facility next to Munich um, where also I think it must be petabytes of data are uh, available here um, and need to, however it might uh, take um, uh, possible, uh, maybe process at any point to help those people. Um, we have a 10 meter um, resolution and that's really 4.5 or let's say together those both satellites, seven petabytes per month raw data. And someone needs to, um, needs to uh, make use of that. And if you make use of that, you can detect what is for, for example, the chlorophyll content of the leaves on the ground for a specific, uh, crop for a specific area, and you can do quite a lot of complex simulations based on this Copernicus data. What um, we did yet now here, that's an analysis uh, of the use case, a worldwide analysis of maize leaf area index. That means how green and how big are the, leaflet, the leaves of maize around the globe. Uh, and that's what you see in colors here is a simulation. You see all the red points here uh, over the cross. That's the points where they uh, validated their simulation, again, a manual observation. Um, and this simulation needed really a petascale computing power and on huge parts of the Super MOOC and G was computed. And that is really data challenging because having such a simulation on the complete globe, it's really, really challenging, not only for the stability of the application, but also, of course, of the data processing. Um, you, that's how you could configure the workflow and the pipeline, but you saw that, I think, two weeks ago by Piotr. Um, that's the MAE. And what I want to, with what I want to finish is the, the most valuable um, release we did is the mini process, because you can we have here um, the software research um, uh, uh, the, the catalog, I'm sorry, the software research directory. Uh, you can browse any software released. Uh, you can have a look, the, the GitHub links and all the publications are available there. And you it simply can spin up a mini Lopsity version of the data service, a mini Slurm cluster you can really deploy your, your application to, and a mini IEE where you can figure everything and that's coming in a box in a virtual machine, you simply can download. Uh, you find that all on software.process-project.eu. Going back um, to our modules, I want to uh, finish with an outlook that we want not uh, a sinking ship with the containers. We want to contribute with our process framework that those containers are well portable and make uh, science 
enable more scientific research on a, on a newer level. So we don't want to have that. We want to have a quite good looking to a container production environment through mod mod modularity, containerization, and use cases enable the usage of new systems and of course enhance their own applications to do a lot of things that you see here on the right that have already been done by a lot of people. And with this, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Hey, Max, uh, many thanks for, for this uh, uh, great overview of uh, this three years of research uh, uh, <coughs> towards exascale computing and data processing.